I'm Turl, and I'm going to tell you why you are a physicist, and you might not even know it. I mean, maybe you do, but you might not. And I'm going to tell you that physics is for everyone, and physics is something that everyone actually does, including philosophers, fish, and cats. Because physics, physics is all about figuring out patterns in things and looking for predictions and theories which most of us just call walking or talking or whatever but we come up with these theories about what's going to happen and we decide what's the probability that when I walk over here the ground's going to still be there and there's going to be a force pushing up on me. Well, I think the probability is pretty high. What do you think? Yay! We're right. But every once in a while, there might be a hole there. You know, there might be a trap. Bear trap. We fall in. So, then we have to adjust our probabilities and say, well, sometimes what we think is going to happen doesn't happen. But, I want to go way back to when I was a little kid and tell you about a pattern that I figured out. Now when I was, I don't know, maybe 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, I used to go to the Museum of Science in Boston. And right as you walked in, on the right hand side, right after you walked in, there was an exhibit that had a big clear box. It was huge. It was like five times the size of little old me. And there was a giant box. And inside this clear box, there were like two big window panes on it, and they were only about that far apart. And between those window panes were some pegs. And all through this whole big rectangular box, there were these pegs spread out, evenly spaced. And then at the very top of the box, there was a little machine that would drop little balls, um, little plastic balls, wooden balls, I don't know, little, little black balls. And they would fall down these pegs, and they were going boink, 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 And then another one would come down, boink, 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 boink. And it was random. They would fall in a random order. And I would just sit there and stare at these balls. And then at the bottom of this pegboard were a bunch of slotted columns where the balls could fall into, so that they didn't just collapse. And they wouldn't bounce off of each other, so they would they would you would see where they landed. And what was amazing is all of these balls falling randomly. At the bottom, there was this perfect curve, this perfect hill of balls, just like a beautiful, perfect mound of sand or a you know a mountain top. But it was, it was just perfect. It would go up and then down. And there, you know, right at the bottom, there were just a few balls on the edges, and there was a big pile in the middle. And it was, like, amazing that all this randomness could be totally predictable. How is that? My little, my little ten-year-old mind said, huh. Fast forward, like, about thirty-some years, and I'm an adult, and I'm going through a whole bunch of challenging, emotional, all kinds of stuff. And I'm trying to figure out why. Why is all of this happening? Why is my life so crazy? Why is the world the way it is? And so I started delving into philosophy. And you could hear from philosophers all sorts of interesting theories. There were the people who said, oh, it's all one, we're all connected, we're all a part of this greater whole. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. And then there were these other people who said, there are two forces in life. There's the yin and the yang, the male and the female. And I was like, yeah, 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 that makes sense too. And then there were these people who said, oh, there's a trinity, there's this balance of, of the triangle, you know, here, here, and here, of balance of forces. And then there were the people who said there were four forces, there were solids, liquids, gases, and energy. Um, or the, the Wiccan folks who said that there are four forces and that there are earth, water, air, and fire. And I was like, yeah, okay, uh, but, but why are there all these different philosophies saying all these different things, which all make sense? And I was like, hmm, how does this work, all of these different categories? So, 
came up with this idea of figuring out how to categorize stuff. So, I'm going to show you this. I got a pile of rocks. And here's my pile of rocks. Right there. There's my beautiful, lovely pile of rocks. Most of them came from the beach. Um, and there's some shells in there, too. So, I decided to start figuring out how to sort these things. And I was like, well, you know, I can sort them by size, but um, that's not really very interesting. And that's not very realistic necessarily because there's some things that are the same size or there's some things that are just very different shapes and how do you know what the size is and you can go by mass which is you know fine but I think it's more interesting to go by energy and while everything here is has energy even though it's pretty you know immobile right now what it is is it's giving off light which is energy the light is going into the camera so you can see it. So that's how we know that it's producing some energy or it's at least reflecting some energy, in this case, from the sun. So anyway, so I decided to sort my things by light. And uh, so I'm going to put my dark things over on one side over here and the light things on the other side. And it's going to take me a little bit. And this is, this is what's cool, is that um, we don't need any fancy electronic equipment to do this kind of physics. It's um, just, you know, your eyes. You look at it and you're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's lighter than the other one. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's light, that's light. Yeah, it's kind of in the middle, you know. It doesn't have to be perfect. But, um, and what's also interesting is, uh, you know, you wonder what other people see with this, this stuff. You know, some of it. Like, would a bee, would a bee see something different? And what about this one that's, that's kind of a, d a redder color? You know, is, is red closer to the black or the blue or the white? I don't know. If we had a, if we did have some fancy measuring equipment, we could um, measure the actual waves of electricity, waves of uh, light that are coming off of these things and then we could uh, we could tell exactly which waves were longer and which waves were shorter and that's how we would know but why did I put that over there but for now we're just gonna do a nice little simple experiment where we don't need any fancy equipment and oh that one definitely goes over here and that one goes over here all right, so we've done a pretty good job here of getting half of the half of the things that are light. The lightest half of our universe, our whole universe. Everything was connected before, but now, hey, it's not connected now. It's it's separated. So now we have two things. We've got our yin and we've got our yang, or maybe that's yin and that's yang. I don't know. You just said it. Um, so anyway. So there are two categories. Wow, yay, we, we did that. Well, that's not very exciting. So, so now what? How do we get three out of this? How do we get three categories? Well, okay, let's do it again. Let's divide this pile over here into the lightest and the darkest ones. Put the lighter ones half, the lighter half over here, and the darker half over here of this pile. Yeah, I think that one goes over there. And that gives us, that gives us that. I'm going to take a couple more dark ones. And now I'm going to take half of the later half of this pile, move it into the, with this pile to get us three, because we're trying to make three, remember, not four. And I don't know. Some of these are... Okay. So, we have the lighter ones over here. We have the darker ones over here. And then we have this beautiful mixed pile that's kind of neither light nor dark. It's a nice balance. Well, so I did this. I got my three categories. And I said, hey, you know, we could keep going with this. You know, we could we could split... We could split up this one again, and then split up this one again. 
so that we would have four categories. We could take half of this and half of this and move it over here and half of this and half of this and move it over here. I was like, yeah, okay. So I actually drew this all out onto a lovely picture here with pretty colored dots. And I started, you can see at the top, I started with a rainbow of dots and then I moved them into the the more red colors of the rainbow and then the more blue and purple colors of the rainbow over there and as I keep going down I take half from this one and I put it over there and half from that one put it there half from that put it over there and half from that put it down there as you can see it makes this kind of interesting pattern and I discovered that this pattern is called Pascal's triangle it was also invented totally separately from Pascal um, from the Chinese and uh, we don't know who, nobody put their name on that because the Chinese are very cooperative and they, they don't like taking credit for anything <laughs> for themselves, whereas, you know, the Western folks do. But anyway, so this, if you want to look it up, it's called Pascal, P-A-S-C-A-L, and uh, it's a triangle. So if you do a search for the internet, you can find out just an enormous amount of fascinating information about this thing. But what's extra cool is I discovered that this is exactly the same as my little pile that I saw with the pegboard of all the balls falling down in the nice, perfect curve. And you know why? And that's because it's all about probability. And that's what sorting all these things tells us. It tells you how much probability you're going to have in any given situation. So if you divide categories, you have two categories and then you want to divide them into three, there will actually be more probability of things being in the middle than on the edges, which is kind of cool. And that also tells you about probability when you're doing physics in any form, whether it's deciding the physics of whether you can walk on the ground over here and whether or not you're going to fall over, or the physics of figuring out, you know, the, the way that the planet is going to spin around the solar system, or whether you can figure out how uh, airplane flies through the air. All of this is physics. And what's cool is that you don't actually need any equations to do most of the physics that you do. Because just like a fish, and just like a cat, and just like a <laughs> philosopher, like myself, you predict things all the time. You predict things that are going to happen, and that includes emotions. You can predict emotions. You can say, it, there's highly likelihood that if I smile and say hello, you're going to smile and say hello back. But there's also a probability, you know, down on the edge where those, those rare things are on the edge that, you know, you might just completely ignore me. Or maybe there's a slightly higher chance that you'll just wave or you'll just smile. But we all do this. We all do this in our brains. And you know why that is? That's because we're all made of physics. We all follow the laws of physics. Fish, cats, philosophers, and everyone else actually follows the laws of physics in our brains, the way our brains work, the way our bodies work, the way everything works, is all physics. Which is why, no matter what you do, the best way to be a physicist is to explore what you're most interested in, not what somebody else tells you to be interested in, because you can't be interested in things you're not interested in. So find the things that you're most interested in exploring and predicting and finding theories about that can help you make better choices and figure out how to get places better that you want to go. Explore as many different options as you can in that field, whatever it is that you're interested in. And then tweak your predictions based on what you find. Say, most of the time this happens. Find that big pile in the middle. And then you could say, some of the time, this happens, that sort of middling pile on the side. And then every once in a while, maybe this other thing happens. And that's 
how to do excellent physics. So now that you know that you're a philosopher, you can figure out what you're interested in and go out and be not only a philosopher, but a physicist and whatever else you want to be. And you can do it in an excellent way. And you don't need math equations. You don't need complicated symbols and things. Although if you want to use those and they work for you, fantastic. Those are great for some people. I happen to not be able to comprehend them. I have a weird brain that says, gobbledygook. It's just the way I am, I guess. I don't know. But what I can do is I can do these actual experiments with my hands. And then I can go out and I can, I can figure things out in my head and I can draw diagrams and I can map things. And if that works for you too, whatever. Whatever works for you to make good theories, to make experiments, and to test your experiments out and then to use what you found in your real life, then you're a physicist. Congratulations.